Do you seek the freedom to pursue greater meaning and purpose in your life? Is there something that you're passionate about that you'd like to support by giving time, talent, or money? Do you seek a level of financial freedom to live an ideal life as you uniquely define it? Welcome to the Money and Meaning Show with Jeff Bernier, a show dedicated to helping you gain the confidence and freedom to lead a life of personal significance and help you get your actions and resources in alignment with what matters most. Hello and welcome to the Money and Meaning Show. My name is Jeff Bernier. I am your guide as we get together monthly to have a conversation that uh, integrates money and meaning. And so this show is all about how do we have deep conversations about meaning and purpose and joy and, you know, what gets us up out of bed every day uh, and wealth management. Uh, how do we create the margin? to go pursue our vision of a meaningful, joyful life. And so that's what we attempt to do on this show. And, you know, I started this show in 2018 uh, as sort of an experiment. Um, you know, in our wealth management practice, we serve a very specific type of household. And quite frankly, our services aren't right for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. But after 37 years of doing this, I decided that maybe we had some information that a broader audience might find useful. So we started the Money and Meaning Show, and I got a lot more intentional as well about writing and blogging and those kinds of things. And, and as those of you know, I wrote a book late last year called The Money and Meaning Journey uh, to really just try to share information uh, with a broader audience. And, you know, one of the things that I've uncovered in the last several years is that I value growth, personal growth, professional growth, spiritual growth. And as such, I, I love podcasts and I go to conferences and I like to read books in things that, quite frankly, just interest me. Um, and fortunately uh, for you and for our clients, a lot of that relates around wealth management. And uh, several months ago, I ran into a podcast called The Rational Reminder Show. And I was attracted to it because one of our investment partners from Dimensional Fund Advisors, Gerard O'Reilly, who is the co-CEO of Dimensional, was on this show, and I got hooked on the show. It's a terrific podcast called The Rational Reminder. And again, last September, I was at a conference, and um, walking into the conference, I looked beside me, and a guy was walking around with a Rational Reminder backpack on. I said, man, I listened to that show. Do you know those guys? And he said, yeah, I am one of those guys. So our guest today, uh, I ran into at the Future Proof Conference back in September, and I'm so excited to have him on today. He's got a lot of uh, uh, great insight that we're going to benefit from. So today we're going to welcome on Cameron Passmore, and I'll, I'll just read a quick uh, high-level bio of Cameron, and I'll get him on, on here. So Cameron Passmore is with PWL Capital in Ottawa, Canada, and he is the executive chairman and a portfolio manager with the firm. Uh, Cameron and his team serve a broad range of affluent clients throughout Canada. He's been in the industry, the, the wealth management industry, since 1990, joined PWL in 1997. In 2021, he was named the executive chairman and portfolio manager and also um, leads client engagements as well. Uh, he's got a degree uh, from McGill University. He is a chartered investment manager. Uh, a financial management advisor and a fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute. So without me reading his big long bio, welcome Cameron. Delighted to have you with us today. Jeff, I'm 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 so pleased you invited me. It's great to see you again. And it's a quite the the intro. And it's I mean, I'm your spirit twin up here in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, a, a career of learning and a whole lot of luck. And and the fact that you and I met that way at the conference is just such a great illustration of where luck brings you know, two brothers together effectively, and we've had a career side by side unbeknownst to each other for over 30 years. So uh, great to, well, to, to see you again and to, to, to be on your show. Well, that's right. I, I say all the time, I've had a lot of who luck in my life. I've met a lot of really good who's that have influenced me. And, uh, and again, getting to get to just learn from you guys on your show. And then of course, meeting you at the conference was, was, uh, was neat. So, uh, you know, I love just to start the show, letting our audience get to know you a little bit. So do you mind, just sort of at a high level, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. Uh, high level, I'm 57-year-old guy, lives in Ottawa, Canada. I've had an incredible 
fortunate uh, life. I grew up in a small town in Quebec. Uh, I got the chance to go to University of Montreal and then moved a little bit west to Ottawa. So I'm about two hours to the west of Montreal, nice. Canada's capital, and kind of locked into this industry. I uh, have two fantastic kids that I'm immensely proud of, and I have a wonderful fiance that I'm engaged to. We're getting married next year, Lisa. Uh, congratulations, yeah. So I got this great family life. I have an incredible career. I've got this great love of learning. And yeah, and it's just such a fun place to, to learn about yourself, to learn about how to help people and how to try to make a difference in the world. Yeah, well, that's 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 really neat. As I mentioned to you before we got on the show, I have relatives up you know, in the Montreal, Quebec province area. And of course, we I joke all the time, we, we sort of butchered the pronunciation of my last name uh, down in South Georgia many years ago, but uh, but it is a neat it is a neat area that you're from there. So so how long and tell me a little bit about what you do at P- PWL and your career path prior to PWL and and how you how you transition to the work you do now. Uh, sure. So I, I graduated and I, I mean, I've been obsessed with commerce and trying to add value to people from a very young age. You know, I had a little small micro businesses when I was like seven years old. I just found it interesting how you can create demand and provide a service and grow something like even from seven years old with my little worm business. And, you know, that kind a of worm carried, business, a worm business. Yes. I told this story in the podcast like a couple bait? months ago, like fishing worms, bait, Okay, a little, yeah. a little bait business. And I was selling gotcha. worms to my father's friends who loved to go oh, fishing. Cool. And it was, even though it's very small and I was very young, I was obsessed with, okay, I could find a product you know, come up with the price and create demand and they would come back. So I was always enterprising like this as a kid. And then I, I, I remember when I was maybe a little bit older, maybe nine years old, delivering papers. And I discovered as I was delivering papers, the magic of compound interest. Hmm. So back then savings bonds were earning 10%. You just, just do the math in your head. It's like, wow, seven years for doing nothing. You could double your money. Yeah. And this, and it's funny to look back. I was like under the age of 10, but these things started to crystallize. Anyways, I uh, I graduated from university. I was a butcher as well when I was a kid. So I got hired by a a beef wholesaling company selling the ultimate commodity beef. And it's hard to add value to a beef carcass. So I I ended up realizing there's an opportunity to add value in something and change people's lives in this burgeoning wealth management industry. And in Canada, it was just starting then with commission loaded mutual funds. And I didn't know anything about the business, but I knew it was better than selling beef. So I started in the business in the early nineties and realized again, luck. I, I ended up sitting with a, a mutual fund executive that said, if you don't go fee based and get off the commission train, this is 95, Jeff, right? You early. don't change. You're going to be out of business in five years. So we pivoted to going fee based to, to take out the conflicts of interest. And at that time, as you know, ETFs were just kind of coming out and, and indexing was becoming a thing which if you're commission based, you couldn't even acknowledge that indexing made any sense at all. Right. So I ended up meeting uh, you know, my now good friends at PWL and we ended up migrating to this fully uh, dealership platform where you, where you could access ETFs. And once you get into this world, and if you're a learner, you come across people like Dan Solon, who I know you know, and, and mm-hmm. Larry Swedro. And once you read their books, all roads lead to indexing. And once you get into this indexing world, all roads lead to these other value-added providers like dimensional funds, right? And and where these ideas came from and academics like Fama and French and, and McQuown and all these people that have had this incredible influence in this revolution that's happened. So we ended up creating a fee-based index type practice with a focus on financial planning. And then in 2011, we met you know some people at a local tech company and ended up at our practice change from being a practice to becoming an enterprise because we went through enormous growth over the last five years. So my current role, and I'm also really um, obsessed with making sure we have a hundred year firm that's being transitioned properly to the next generation. I'm not looking to hoard yeah. equity or hoard relationships. I want the next generation to take this over and create this vibrant thing right. that can impact playing, Canadians. Playing the infinite time. game. Yeah. It's the infinite game that, that literally the infinite game. So right. my current role to, to, keep this moving here is I focus on the podcast, probably a third of my time, helping develop talent, you know, create awareness in the marketplace. I work on governance and like our, our board and, and, and helping the next generation really embrace, you know, future leadership of the company, future ownership of the company, 
you know, placing our stake in the ground in the industry. So that's what my focus is now, less so on the gotcha. client relations because our team is really running with that. Right. Awesome. Well, you, you, uh, you know, I think that I'm, I'm guilty. Sometimes I'm attracted to, to people and things that sort of, I agree with, I think our investment philosophies might be somewhat similar, but tell me a little bit about PWL's investment philosophy. How do you view the investment management process? You just gave some pretty big hints, I think right there in your, in your preamble, but tell me a little bit about how you guys view building portfolios. At the root of it all is that markets work. You have enormous competition with incredibly bright people with endless technology and all of this brilliant work by brilliant people day in, day out, all this information ends up in the price of stocks, ends up in the price of bonds and science. And there's enormous science, as you know, over the past 50 plus years on asset pricing models, basically academic studying, how markets work, where do returns come from? So instead of trying to figure out where the market is wrong, why not assume the market is not necessarily right, but pretty close to right that it's not worth trying to find out what's wrong. So basically put your arm around what we've learned and build portfolios that assume it's right and then tilt towards parts of the market that science has shown has higher expected returns. This is all well known. It's well documented. And the incredible thing is you can now do this at a cost that people 30 years ago wouldn't have dreamed of. Right. Like you can build portfolios, the raw product cost in Canada now, right. and it's, it's even cheaper in the U S for less than we would have paid in, in, in provincial sales tax on products 30 years ago. It's just completely right. mind bending the research that has happened on both where returns come from and how to build tools like ETFs, like low cost index portfolios. So that that's where we stand. Gotcha. Okay. I, I may come back to that in a moment. Let me, let me kind of go to your show a, a minute. Um, so I, the Rational Reminder is an incredible podcast, as I mentioned. It, it's a great resource. It, it provides a lot of great technical information on how markets work and uh, investments and a deep dive in a lot of that type of thing. Um, and I find it's probably a great resource for other advisors around the country as well as individual investors. But you also do delve into financial planning, um, you know, even even things like the math of financial planning. You had a terrific episode on just the math of financial planning. I mean, you know, a, a lot of people aren't even, again, you talk about learning at an early age with your worm business, but many people don't naturally understand, you know, compounding and time value of money and all, all that kind of stuff. So you, so you do go broader than just investments on the show. And since this show tries to do, you know, an intersection of money and meaning, I'd love uh, and your show does too, by the way, uh, because of some of these broader topics. But tell me a little bit about uh, the podcast. So how how did it get started and, and what was the motivation for the show? Uh, motivation was um, we believe that people were looking for content and, and that was driving Google searches to try to build our practice. So gotcha. we were encouraged by our, our lead of marketing to say, just start doing content. So my colleague on the show, Ben, mm-hmm. Um, he started doing common sense investing YouTube videos. These are 10, 12 minute videos. He was very good at it and built up quite an audience quite quickly. And then you see, well, how the algorithms work and make it more popular than we were encouraged to do a podcast. And we're like, we didn't know what it was. Maybe you didn't know when you started. We just no. bought two mics and sat in a room. We didn't have a clue <laughs> what we were doing. So it's been this incredible experiment. We just start trying stuff and you got to work out the kinks and you figured, okay, we're going to have a guest. And then we got in this rhythm of one week it's a guest and next week it's us. And we just kind of pivot back and forth. And then we folded in, you know, book club that we added on. We added on a merchandise store. We added on a community. We just kind of bolted on these ideas to this right. thing. And it ends up kind of becoming somewhat popular. And yeah, and you end up getting interesting guests. We've had incredible guests and not just the big names, but there's been people that have come on that are just people you might not have thought of that frankly, it blew us away in terms of our thinking. So we're always adjusting our thinking. And and the more you learn, the more you have questions for more people. And it's just become this incredible learning experience and experiment to, to try to communicate ideas to people. Right. Yeah. You had some guests on recently that really went deep on values and goals and discovery oh. um, and the psychology around yeah. obviously being vulnerable and, and kind of figuring out what matters. Um, so how do you guys in your practice do that? Do y'all, uh, do y'all integrate that type of discovery in your financial planning practice? How do you go about, how do you go about doing that? 
like with clients? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, this is a big thing that, that Ben did a deep dive on last year, which I know you know about, which was his goal study. Like the, right. how people f- formulate goals is really interesting. And most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. So if you ask about goals, you'll get, you know, what, what are your goals, Jeff? Oh, I want to retire at this age. I want this amount of income. I want a cottage. I want to educate my kids. So they're very common, easy ones. Okay. Now, Jeff, try to expand that list. Okay. I want to give to my church. I want to, whatever you might want to do, right? And then what the science shows is that when prompted with a list of goals after doing that, you actually improve your goals. You say, huh, I hadn't yeah. thought about that. I'll take that one and this one. I'll modify it. So it's this experience of taking people through this. Yeah. Um, so we've been working hard on that, that idea of one question, two questions. Here's some goals. Let's try to make that list of goals as, as complete and meaningful as possible. And you right. mentioned a recent guest, like we had a professor Ralph Keeney on late right. last year, I think it was incredible. And the line that he said that I'll, I'll always remember is the only way you can purposely influence anything in your life is by your decisions. Mm-hmm. What drives your decisions? Mm-hmm. How do you create those objectives? You had to get down to your values. You really have to scratch to get into mm-hmm. what someone's values are. And a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about that because we're all so busy, right? Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm not surprised that obviously you have on these guests and you have these deep conversations that you wouldn't take what you've learned and integrate it into your practice. You know, in terms of goals, I think that's a, I'm, I'm learning some new things. You know, I had Brian Portnoy on from Shaping Wealth recently, and I'm in a, I'm in a coaching cohort with him yep. around uh, being a better advisor in on some of these relational uh, decision-making uh, ideas. And, you know, goals are really important because they do create uh, a target, you know, and then we can measure our progress on against something that matters to us as opposed to a benchmark that is irrelevant, quite frankly. Um, but he talks about the dangers and goals. And I know your show also is, has done a lot of work on the happiness literature and positive mm-hmm. psychology because it is kind of a yin and a yang. I mean, the goal is out there to get you out of bed and it's, it, it, it can be motivating, but there can be a danger too uh, that you don't enjoy the journey. And I know that you guys have had a lot of guests on about those kinds of, of topics as well. Would you agree with that in general, that you've got you to sort of strike a balance? Absolutely. And, and, and we've also had people talk about how you change through your life and your goals might change. So it's really to be in touch with what's important to you. Like if you really enjoy being around your family, understand that experiences matter more than things, right? So you may want right. to, instead of saying, I want a cottage in 20 years, so I can have time with my family at the cottage. Maybe it's more important to do things now. And you realize, well, yeah, the cottage is fun, but it's a lot of work. And in right. Canada, you may not go there, you know, five or six months of the year because of the weather. You say, well, okay, maybe it's better to repurpose the funds that I would have for that into an annual trip somewhere, a meaningful trip. So it's those kinds of things because your values don't likely change your life, but your goals right. can change. Right. Well, I've talked a lot and I talked a lot in my book about going deeper on on what matters most. And it really boils down to values. I mean, it really does boil down to what is, you know, what really what really matters. And many of us don't really take the time uh, to to really dig in uh, in any meaningful way to that. So I think that uh, I think I think striking that balance is important and, you know, taking the time to go to go deep. And again, like I said, you've had some some great conversations about that on your, on your show. Um, you know, there are three things that I, I love talking about. I love having these deep conversations with clients or, um, an audience about finding what makes your heart come alive. You know, what are the things that really get you excited about life? And, you know, what do you think your purpose is? I, I love having people tell me their stories about their values and what really matters. Um, I love the science of investing. A lot of the things you just talked about. I love the literature. I love, and, and that's why I've been attracted to some of the stuff that Ben, I know, is really passionate about on your show. And that's, you know, the the the, the evidence, if you will, evidence-based investing. And then finally, I, I think I, I, I love teaching people about how to be more rational investors. And I know that's one of the missions of your show. Um and, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes in my case, I, I am guilty of, uh, you know, of confirmation bias. So I get attracted to shows or literature that supports my current belief. But you had a you had a guest on not that long ago who challenged some of 
the thought processes that that we think about sometimes as advisors. And I don't know if you remember the show very well, but it was Scott Cedarberg at the University of Arizona. Y'all had him on mm-hmm. not that long ago, and he went through some of his research mm-hmm. around uh, returns all over the globe. I know, I know sometimes in the United States, we're so focused on U.S. markets, but he took it all over the globe and had some pretty interesting insights. Do you remember that show? Oh, I remember it well. Scott was that's a perfect example of someone who is, you know, you could say is under the radar in the podcast circuit, but who right. has done incredible research. Plus, he's an incredibly good communicator and a really nice guy. Like he was real, it was a really fun conversation. And what he did was he took all this global data going back, you know, 100 plus years, but took out all the survivorship biases that are in many often used databases to show kind of what can go wrong, what has gone wrong if you think we can learn from the past. So yeah, it was a great conversation. Yeah. So he looked at, um, he looked at returns in the broad asset classes around the globe. Once he normalized for some of these biases that are in the data, correct. And any, any, I mean, I have three, I have a couple of takeaways. I was just curious if you had any, any big ones from, from that. Oh, the big one is that you're, there's a chance that in real terms, you're not going to make money over 30 years. Yeah, exactly. And this goes back to your, your, point when you set up this question, which is we love stories. Right. So a lot of people don't know that fact, but, and I don't, I think most people think, well, you can't lose money over 30 years. In stocks, well, you, right. In, in stocks, well, even in fixed income, as you know, from that conversation, it's even worse for fixed income in real terms, right? Right. Um, over, over 30 year periods. But we look for stories from people in our industry, our respective industries to make them feel like that's the profit who can foresee what's going to happen and you're going to be okay as opposed to just embracing markets. So, I mean, he made a great argument for um, understanding the benefits of diversification, understanding the benefits of going around the world with your portfolio, but realizing it's not a free lunch. Right. Yeah. You know, I think we, you know, in the United States, at least, um, the way I see it, I mean, since 1900, I mean, heck, the United States was an emerging market in 1900. So we had a we had a really good century, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. We had a really good century for financial assets, but when you look around the globe, it's not it's not it's not guaranteed that the next thirty or forty years are going to be like the last thirty or forty or a hundred. Right. And I think the statistic was there was a thirteen percent chance uh, that you would lose money over a thirty year period in real terms. That's right. In stocks, um, and again, that was looking all over the globe. Uh, I think the I think the probability was significantly better if you diversified internationally to four percent point. Yeah, all the way down to 4%. So yep. you went from 13 to 4. Um, and then interestingly, uh, it, you know, there, there may not be a lot of alternatives because bonds are even worse. So bonds had a 27% chance of real loss over a 30-year period, real meaning after inflation, and, and cash was 37%. So even yep. though even though stocks are not, you know, we, we look at them as sort of guaranteed over a 30-year period, which they're certainly not. I mean, I think that's like one in eight chance that you you'd have a, a negative real return. It still may be the best game in town. Would you would you agree with that yeah, in terms yeah. of preserving purchasing power? Yeah, and, and that's exactly uh, the point that Professor Ken French made recently, which is like, how do you define risk? What is risk here? A well, risk is is the risk of not preserving purchasing power over long periods of time. In that case, bills and bonds look a whole lot riskier, as opposed to many people look at risk in the stock market as volatility of price variability around a mean. So make sure you know what your definition of risk is. And you just illustrated that bonds and bills are not riskless over a long period of time. Right. right. And the other thing that goes, it's in the back of my mind, because we interviewed Professor yeah. Eugene Fama, and he made the argument for home country bias, particularly the US market, we're talking about, you know, you, you eliminate the risk of, you know, assets being repossessed, because arguably, with, with the financial and governmental and legal framework in the United States, you're protected from repossession of assets. So there's always that little voice of Fama in the background that says, yeah, this is probably true, but there's other things that may want you to tilt more towards home country bias. Yeah. And that's, and that's difficult in, you know, like in Canada where you're have a, uh, you know, where you don't have as many securities I'm thinking as you do that's in right. us. And, you know, a lot of it's commodity driven industries are, yes, so again, there's all there's there's risk in that too. Obviously, I guess is the point. Yep. I mean, exactly. You know, for you for a U.S. Uh, investor, I mean, clearly 
uh, diversification to international makes all kinds of sense, but it even makes more sense in economies that are not as diversified or, um, and again, that kind of gets back to your investment philosophy, which was, you don't really have to know. You, you just have to trust markets um, and capture, you know, this, this market premium that you can collect all over the world. Um, I, I may be oversimplifying your philosophy, but that's. No, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, that's kind of it. You don't you don't have to know, you know, where the hot country is. You just have to be diversified enough where you're capturing that that equity, uh, that positive expected return in being in stocks versus bonds or cash and, and so forth. Um, I, I don't remember. Did y'all have Auntie Illman on your show from we HQ sure, Mark? Sure, we sure did. Auntie was uh, what a guy. What a brilliant communicator. Yeah, I mean, AQR is just a great firm, of course, as well. Right. Yeah. I, th I think his book, um, I, I read his book, Expected Returns, you know, 10 years ago, which was a big, yep. a big, a big one uh, about where returns come from and these various factors that you and I uh, are interested in. Um, hmm. And then, of course, you wrote a more recent book uh, called Investing Among Low Expected Returns. Yep. And his timing on that was was pretty fortuitous, I guess, because it it was before the recent difficulties in, in the equity and, and fixed income markets. But the case was pretty simple is, you know, returns are largely driven by price. And so low prices give you opportunities for higher expected returns and high prices and, and low yields give you an expectation of lower returns. Do you generally agree with that mindset that we may be in an era of lower, lower expected returns in the intermediate term? I do. I'm not making a forecast. I just think that, sure. that, that that's a reasonable expectation. I mean, yeah. it's, it's discount rates, right? So, right. Yeah. And, and I, and I know from, from your show uh, and from the, some of the things you mentioned before and some of your partners like dimensional that you do believe as we do that um, having some exposure or tilting to these various factors can be helpful uh, in, in regards to higher expected returns. And when I say, factors uh, for the audience. We're talking about things that the academic literature and the research has shown can add higher expected returns, like tilting the value or tilting the small, yeah. tilting the more profitable companies, things of that nature. So you guys do that as well. Is that correct? We do. And I always find it funny when people question that. And I, I know you're not, Jeff, but often people say, why do you do that? It's like, how come no one ever questions the market premium? Right, people expect higher expected returns from the market, having a market-based portfolio like a market cap index. But the reality is that factors like value and profitability actually have higher persistence over ten years than the market factor does. Hmm. Like, well, if you believe in the market factor, you can't ignore the evidence around a value premium or a, a profitability premium. These are all technical premiums that are easily available now in, in the marketplace, and you can put them in a portfolio set rules around how much you have there. And I'm not talking big bets. I'm talking about right. tilts as you are. So you right. put tilts in with specific allocations to them and make it rules-based such that you're automatically rebalancing your portfolio. You can add, you know, our, our recent paper um, conservatively put the expected premium in a portfolio of around half a percent by doing that without a lot of additional uh, volatility in price if you define risk that way. So to me, it, it makes sense, but it's also a story you can understand. If you pay less for something has to have a higher expected return. Information is in that price. All right. a share price is, is the market's consensus of the present value of future profits or dividends, right? Well, right. the share price goes down mathematically you have a higher expected return. Right. And now you can get a whole pool of these. You don't need to pick just one or two because this, the, the, these effects are happening systematically across the market. Well, just pick up the factor, tilt a little bit of the factor in your portfolio. Well, and again, I, I I think two two things that come to mind as you're speaking is I think oftentimes we get the pushback uh, because the value premium uh, across most developed markets, at least, had been had a rough run. Yes, because uh, it was a very concentrated market during the you know during the tech boom of yep. the recent tech boom, I guess I would say the large growth boom, and so uh, so two things I, I think some of the pushback is recency bias. Because fifteen through twenty, um, the, the you know the the value premium was pretty negative, um, so I guess that would be a premium. But um, but uh, even though it is persistent over long periods of time, it wasn't in that in that. And the second point is 
uh, the importance of a multi-factor approach. So you don't you don't lean too far just on value or too much on small or too much on profitability or even momentum. You have a multi-factor approach. And just like diversification of asset classes, um, it can add some value because they don't they don't all work at the same time, generally speaking. Is that is that do you agree with those generally? I, I agree with that. I mean, but this is again understanding when you buy into these factors, what you're buying into, what has been the experience. No one said it's a guaranteed return, and you should have known there could be periods of underperformance. But the end of the period you're talking about, like probably two, three years ago, yes, the valuations, the valuation differential between value and growth was, I think, 95, 99th percentile. Right. Right. And if that isn't a compelling reason to keep up your conviction, Correct. I don't know what is. You just have to yeah. wait it out. But that means you have to have something that is sensible. Well, it makes sense that stocks have different expected returns and something you can believe in and stick with for good reason. That's part of the mission of, of the podcast is to get this information out to help people understand what are you investing in? Why would you stick with it? Because what really matters over a long period of time is having a plan systematically investing and stick to that plan over a long period of time and not look for stories. Oh, value's dead or indexing makes no sense. I need an active manager. I need alternatives. And that's what the industry loves to sell you. They love it. This, this industry is hooked on that. You don't right. need it. It's because all these brilliant people yeah. are doing all this work. I'm not saying that that stuff, there won't be people who will perform. Of course there will be. That's how mean dis distribution of outcomes works. Right. But you don't need it. And there's a chance that by trying to beat it, you'll end up way worse. And that's what the evidence by a long shot shows. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not even close. Um, not even close. Yeah. Um, so in our practice, we don't, we don't use currently, um, you know, illiquid, non-transparent um, alternative investments of any type. Uh, and we're not even, we believe in the data. We just think they're difficult to own for some clients. We're not even using long, short uh, factor exposure. So there's some products out there where you can own the value factor, not only tilting to it, but own it yeah. long, short. In other words, yeah. you're shorting the expensive stocks and you're owning yep. the, the low cost stocks. Do you guys do anything like that in your strategies? Uh, we do not. You do we, not. Okay. So we, very we similar. We believe it's markets work. Let the markets work for your portfolio. And you can start looking at that. Maybe I'm, I'm not convinced that anyone can systematically, especially in a retail world, find the outperformers. There's a lot of money going around. There's a lot of big institutions that I would argue have better access than a retail advisor, certainly in Canada. Um, right. But if you have everything in order, I, I always find it amusing. People get fussed about portfolio construction, picking managers. Like, hold on here. Is your plan rock solid? Are right. you saving enough? Have right. you got all these other things all lined up perfectly such that you, that incremental 20, 50, 80 basis points is going to make that big a difference, really? Right. right. For all the paperwork and risk and and tax reporting and cost. It, it, okay, maybe if you have everything else lined up, maybe. Right. It doesn't happen all that often. Yeah. And and I think the behavioral aspects of this are really critical. It, in, and, I, and, and, to, and to Andy Illman's credit, in his book about lower expected returns, I mean, he's with a firm that constructs some of these liquid yeah. alternative long short strategies and they could be a possible solution in a lower expected return world which he says yes but he spends a lot of time in the book indicating that you should not even go there if you don't have a long time horizon and you can deal with the behavioral issues of being out of sync with the market and many people don't and so even though and that that's kind of the conclusion we came to we can get our clients as far as we need to get them Yep. But we don't really need to go there. And they're, and like I said, they can be difficult to own because they are complex and more expensive. Um, and and, a, and AQR is just a wonderful firm. Auntie Il Ilmanen and and Cliff Asness. I mean, they're they're brilliant and and brilliant communicators around these messages, also. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard a um, we talked about um, some of the other people that are that are big thinkers in our in our industry. Larry Swedro is one that we. We, you mentioned earlier in some of his books and some of his writing, and um, you know he 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 made an analogy many years ago that that I that I borrowed, <laughs> um, and I, I may have butchered it a little bit, but he in terms of building portfolios, portfolio construction, and the benefits of the factor tilts, if you will, tilt into yeah. the to these acad this academic literature. He says it's kind of like taking a trip from New York to San Francisco. You know, if you build a reasonably diversified, low cost 
portfolio. It'll get you probably halfway there, get you maybe to Denver. If you add international and broader asset class exposure, like global real estate and maybe some of the, some things like that, you might get you a little bit further, maybe to Salt Lake City. If you put in the rules, as you mentioned, for rebalancing and tax aware trading, probably get you all the way to Reno. You're so you're almost to San Francisco. And finally, you know, by adding these factor tilts, you know, it gets you the rest of the way to San Francisco. So it's not everybody doesn't have to do it and still may be able to meet their goals. My yeah. fear is that many people are extrapolating past returns and they're unlikely to meet their goals if they don't either save more or spend less or do something a little extra to get higher expected returns. And I think I think the factor tilts are a reasonable chance to improve that opportunity. Um, any thoughts on that? Disagree? Agree? Is the analogy all wet? What do you think? About uh, that? I mean, Larry is a very good friend of mine and has been for a long time. And to me, he's the king of communications in our in our industry. So I would never disagree with Larry. I think that's <laughs> I think that's a great analogy, and I, and I agree. Um, just reading a book that's coming out in another month from Jonathan Clements to, to your mm -hmm. point about habits. So he's got a money coming out called My Money Journey. And it's a wonderful book. Look for it April 25th. Okay. Um, but one of the points he makes and a common thread from all these people that told their money journey is that habits matter. Right. Habits matter. Habits trump whether you got factor tilts or not. Like, let's get the basics in place. Get a good solid plan in place. Understand your values. Build your plan around your values. Understand what makes you happy. So many people get so obsessed with this, often at the expense of relationships and doing other things that are fun in their life. And when you've got this incredible industry with all this knowledge and these tools that are so cheap and so wonderful, why not embrace it? And you're right, just layer in these basic financial planning principles, you're going to make your flight. Right. Yeah, well, this has been well, this has been great, Cameron. I, I appreciate your spending a few minutes with us today. This has been very insightful. And, I, you know, we could talk a long time about a lot of different things, again, because I know you and, and your, your partners there are, are interested in some of the same things we are. And like I said, your podcast has some some phenomenal guests that that I'm sure you've learned uh, a lot from and, and have, imp, imp, uh, you know, implemented in your in your practice and in your in your communications. So how can people find out more about uh, PWL, Cameron, and the Rational Minder Show? Uh, well, the show's on all platforms. We're on YouTube and, of course, all the po podcast platforms. Um, we have a website. Uh, I, I give a shout-out to, to Ben, my co-host and our head of research. He has incredible papers. I would highlight in particular uh, his paper on funding and finding a good life. It's just an incredible uh, anthology of learnings we've had around this whole subject matter, and he did a beautiful paper on it. Okay, where would you find that paper? Just go to our website, pwlcapital.com. It's on there. Great. He also has a paper on expected returns if someone wants to dive into our view of what expected returns are in these different asset classes. We're both on on Twitter, of course, and LinkedIn. And and like you, just love talking to people. So happy if anybody wants to reach out and chat or connect. We're, we're easy that, to find. We're pretty transparent. That, that's, that's awesome. Any any final comments you'd like to share with our audience before we before we wrap it up here? Um, well, thank you for having me on. It's, it's a, so much fun to talk shop with, with, with my brother in Atlanta. Um, we live in an incredible time of knowledge, incredible time of, of, of people that want to learn like you and us and, and many of our other peers in the business, like Brian Portnoy and others that have been on your show. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity for people trying to make a difference in their futures to learn from and to engage with, to, to, to improve their lives. And that's what we're ultimately what you and I are doing, right? We're here to try to make people's lives better. We're doing it through wealth management and goal formation, stuff like that. And just learn, enjoy the, enjoy the, enjoy the time. It's an incredible period for all of us. Yeah, it's, it really is. I mean, that's the, that's sort of the irony. And, and part of the reason I wrote the book, the money and meaning journey is I find people are getting to that second act and they've actually built a reasonable financial plan, but they're not enjoying the journey because they feel like they are supposed to watch CNBC all day, or they're supposed to keep up with the news. And, 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 and we've, we've taken a time in our lives that should be joyful and enjoy the journey. And we've, and we're, we're many people, I shouldn't, this shouldn't be an indictment on everyone, but many of us 
are focused on things that really don't matter that much. Um, we think they do because, as you mentioned, Wall Street and the uh, media kind of wants to get our eyeballs. But um, but you've you've shared some really valuable information here today, Cameron. So thanks so much for being with us. I I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm sure our audience did as well. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please uh, check us out and share it with your friends. Uh, you can find us the show on iTunes and other streaming platforms. Um, leave a comment. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can reach me at moneyandmeaning at tamagrowth.com. Uh, as I mentioned, you can check out the book at uh, Amazon and other places, The Money and Meaning Journey. Um, I also have a website that I created for the book uh, at jeffbernierauthor.com, where there's some additional uh, premium content you could download if you have interest. Uh, but again, thanks so much for being with us today. And until next time, find what makes your heart come alive and put the plans in place to go pursue it. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Money and Meaning Show with Jeff Bernier, a show dedicated to help you gain the confidence and freedom to lead a life of personal significance and help you get your actions and resources in alignment with what matters most. We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions for Jeff or comments on the show, feel free to reach out to us at moneyandmeaning at tandemgrowth.com. Or you can find us on the web at www.tandemgrowth.com. Jeff Bernier is the President and Chief Investment Officer at Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. This show is a production of Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC. All information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as specific financial, legal, or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Listeners should not rely on the content of this podcast as the basis for any investment decisions. A professional advisor should be consulted and or independent due diligence should be conducted before implementing anything discussed in this show. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, does not guarantee its accuracy and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, does not make any representations or warranties as to the accuracy, timeliness, suitability, completeness, or relevance of any information prepared by any unaffiliated third party, such as guests on the podcast, and takes no responsibility for the same.